five. I think I'm the first Daily Telegraph columnist who's going to come out in support of illegal raves. Four. The BBC said the decision was made in response to the restrictions in place on mass singing follow the coronavirus outbreak, as if... Three. There is this embarrassment about being British, as if somehow we have something to be ashamed of. We've since had the great awakening. One. We have left off. Up, up and away. It's blast off number 15 for Planet Normal, the Telegraph podcast that somehow, somehow, has soared away from the mainstream media echo chamber. Sick of shouting at the TV news bulletin? Nursing a sprained shoulder after throwing your glasses case at the radio? Then strap yourself in for some honest-to-goodness news and views from beyond the bubble with Alison Pearson. Hello. And me, Liam Halligan. So, Alison, the summer's over. As the weather cools, the news agenda's clearly hotting up. The NHS is open, we're told, but it's still firmly closed to countless non-COVID patients. The BBC's got a new Director General. We'll come to that. But as we speak, the kids are back at school, most of them, some of them, a few of them, if they can actually reach the school gates as they try to break through the massed ranks of TV news reporters wearing COVID-resistant spacesuits, stuffing boom mics in the kids' face, asking them, why aren't you more petrified? Is our country finally heading back to planet normal, Alison? Have the teaching unions been tamed? Uh, don't count your chickens, Liam. <laughs> don't count your chickens, love. I mean, I think all all it's going to take is for, you know, little Josh in um, year seven to cough in the wrong direction and it'll be tools down lads out we go it's like that peter sellers thing isn't it what was it was it i'm all right jack or something the absolutely um, i absolutely. think i think um yes i mean scotland's schools have been back for about two weeks and i think they've got over 80 percent attendance which is obviously looking pretty good uh in england that some have gone back some are going back today some tomorrow some net some at the start of next week i've got friends whose kids are starting at the beginning of next week um how does it look well they've got very Various, you know, uh, as we as we know from our government, the you know multiple mixed messages. So apparently, year groups are supposed to stay in their bubble. But as I think I've mentioned before, can you imagine telling any fifteen-year-old not to mix with their mates the minute they're outside the school gate? That's yeah. true. I mean, that's the whole point of school. That girl they've got their eye on in the other form. <laughs> I know, I know. I'm not sure if they're policing. I'm not sure behind the bike sheds is now COVID safe. Uh, But look, one of the big problems, of course, going back is not only that, you know how violently I feel about uh, the kids wearing masks. So the government has said... Violently, indeed. Violently. I really... Honestly, I detest seeing the pictures of them in masks. They They do look weird, don't they? they? Rows of kids in masks. Rows of kids in masks. It's pretty dystopian. And as we know, the virus proposes no threat to them. They... They have a very limited capacity to pass it on. No teacher in the world uh, is known to have got COVID from a pupil. So the wearing of masks anyway is uh, is frankly to me an overreaction. Yeah, so the government has said that it will be mandatory in school public areas, not in the classrooms, but only in areas where there is lockdown. But as we know, Liam, if you give this guidance out to head teachers, some are trying to keep as normal environment as possible and others are using it to, you know, to make as much trouble as possible. So we are actually seeing quite disturbing pictures of kids wearing masks in schools where there's no call for them whatsoever. And as you discussed with uh, Helena Morrissey last week, if you've got kids wearing masks and taking the mask off, putting it on again, taking it off. They're touching their face all the time. The mask itself will become a little rag bag of germs, uh, which they're then breathing in. So there are going to be lots of kids with coughs and colds. There are always coughs and colds when kids go back to school because they all mix again, having not seen each other for quite a few weeks. So that does strike me as quite counterproductive, I must say. Can I can I can I shock you now? Yeah, go on. Because I probably I'll strap myself in. Right, strap yourself in. Uh, Pull the. You're going to vote Labour. Pull the. (laughs) It's it's not it's not that much of a shock. Um, No, I I I think I'm the first Daily Telegraph columnist who's going to come out in support of illegal raves. (laughs) 
because now, no. Only because you want to be invited to some. No, no, I'm way beyond my illegal, my laughing gas You turn up incognito. (laughs) Turn up incognito with the dog. But no, listen to this. So when when my kids were little, probably the same with yours, we would get invited to chicken pox parties. And the idea was that one kid would have chicken pox and would pass it round all the non-infected kids and you'd get the chicken pox out of the way. Now, the thing with the illegal raves, which everyone's so disapproving of, is that, you know, the young people, teenagers, you know, under 20s, if they're going to get COVID, that's good, Liam. We keep, we keep forgetting that cases which don't have any symptoms are good. This is a yeah. good thing they will act as a human our young people will hopefully end up acting as a human shield for their grandparents and for more vulnerable people so every time i see someone saying oh look at this disgraceful illegal rave i think you know snog away guys snog away (laughs) you know just let let's 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 pass that you know let's pass those little microbes because honestly seriously it's good i mean did you i don't know i I think in my first stay alert snog your girlfriend (laughs) save lives (laughs) <laughs> so I think in my in my first term at university, I got you know everyone got glandular fever. That that was the kissing disease, wasn't it? But that was the bit you told your parents about. Uh, yeah, <laughs> and exactly. then all the other diseases. <laughs> <laughs> But look, we've been the teaching unions, the school teaching unions, they've been replaced by the joys of the university oh. teacher unions, haven't they? I mean, saying that, oh, we must make sure that universities don't become the care homes of the second wave, i.e. the place where disproportionately lots of vulnerable people unfortunately die of slash with COVID-19. That strikes me as incredibly intemperate, irresponsible language. I thought it was the most scientifically illiterate thing I'd heard. And the fact that it was broadcast on national TV. I mean, I was, you know, you know, I've, you know, I've run out of objects to throw, to throw at the telly. I've put my radio in a, in a, in a, <laughs> a lead anti-Faraday cage. <laughs> But again, we see these professionals in the teaching unions, in the university unions, they should be now really dedicated to supporting young people. Normally, they'd be going back now after five or six weeks. It's been 25 weeks, Liam. And the really serious issue now... I'm glad you said five there. I thought you were going to say something else. (laughs) Go on. 25 weeks. This is the really serious issue is how, you know, how behind are they? And that's the thing that's looming on the horizon now. We've got um, a, a Private Pike is still in charge of the education department. So we so we can imagine... I hate you, Butler. We can imagine... <laughs> he's Blakey, he's not Private he's Blakey. Pike. Blakey, okay, he's Blakey. <laughs> but so we're already, Gavin Williamson is discussing what's going to happen with exams next year because as, as, we, as we've talked about before... Uh, children from private schools and the better better selective schools, the academies, they've been keeping their pupils, you know, well stocked with uh, materials. So it's the exam, the exam years, the GCSE year next summer and the A level year next summer. How far behind are they? And it will probably turn out again that the children from the least advantaged backgrounds and schools are going to be really far behind. So now they're talking about. Uh, possibly pushing the exams back to July, which I don't think is a, is a bad idea. Although I'm sure we'll have the teachers demanding, you know, another sack of gold for for cooperating. But there's July also... 2023. <laughs> yes. No. Well, you've got you've got a daughter, haven't you? Yeah. Who's going to be taking exams next summer? I mean, it's I, not. It's, don't it's... even go there. No. Don't even go. I don't even. I mean, she she's a very bright kid. She'll read it in the papers and. But what, what a message to put out now as we're trying to get kids back to school. And, oh, yeah, by the way, your exams may be delayed. But, look, we're all now back at school, sitting cross-legged with fingers on lips. Time to really get down to work. But your column in this week's Telegraph, top of the Telegraph's website homepage as we speak, is a letter to Tim Davey, the incoming Director General of the BBC. You once loved the BBC, Alison. I once loved the BBC, but now you tell Telegraph readers you feel as if you're in a, an abusive relationship. Yes, I do, you know, because I think when you've loved something, we, we we both grew up in homes where probably there weren't very many books. So the telly was was our window onto the world. Absolutely. And I, and I have such fond memories. I mean, obviously, you know, I think the first thing I watched was with my mum was listen with mother, still traumatised that they put Andy, Pandy and Teddy in the wicker basket at the end of every episode. No. I mean, what happened to them in that basket? Anyway, Big Ted, Little Ted, Hamble, the, Jemima, all, all that, you know, the Blue Peter tortoise through the arched window. You know, I mean, the, these were our this, this these were our 
These were they all carved right. the contours of our young minds. Well, they, well, you know, you, I know you can't take anything seriously, but no, they I did. do take it seriously. They did. I do, and, and me once, too. Once first, I remember watching, you know, I Claudius and watching the Michael Parkinson show, and you had Orson Welles. It's all there. It's all, all. It's all in the hard drive. So all these astonishing, you know, and the, the, the BBC had built up a huge reservoir of affection, I think, and support. And I was a TV critic, Liam, through most of the 1990s. And I would say now there's been a drastic change, I would say, in the last 10, 15 years, where it's become so ideological, so axe grinding, so trying to shoehorn in uh, in leftist uh, liberal opinions the whole time. And not just, obviously, we know that that the news has its own particular agenda. And we saw that during the Brexit uh, referendum. But what I'm talking about is it's almost like at a cellular level in the BBC now. I mean, literally, you can turn on The Archers, which is supposed to be, you know, a soap of Middle England on the radio, you know, nice farming people (laughs) having a chat. And then suddenly, suddenly it'll be some sort of mad, you know... Troop of trans farmers coming over the horizon. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, you know, forget yokel, it's wokel. I mean, yeah. it's literally <laughs> we, it's literally people having conversations. And you think, well, you know, when did anybody on a farm in the East Midlands ever have an opinion like that? So I think there's a, a just yawning chasm between many of the people who pay for the BBC's existence. And I think that, that, that people like us, I increasingly feel that they hold us in thinly veiled contempt, I would say. I couldn't agree more. I completely share your memories about the BBC's importance to our childhood. The BBC was a lifeline to me. That's why I actually think we need to salvage something from this kind of political ferment now about the BBC. We need to salvage something from a huge clash negotiation that's going to happen between this new director general and the government, and rightly so. Um, I actually think during the referendum, the Brexit referendum, the BBC was just about the right line of relatively balanced, given that the government itself and the civil service was pumping out so much uh, anti-leave propaganda. But it was when the result went against the way that almost every senior BBC executive and on-screen person thinks, and they were shocked by that. They then bet the ranch on trying to reverse the referendum, as we've said before. Then on top of that, we've since had the great awakening and as you say, this this agenda that's um, uh, in the hearts of you know a very very tiny minority of of people has pervaded out of news and current affairs right across all kinds of drama and entertainment programs. It's absolutely mad. And now Tim Davies coming in, he does have a really tough job. But unless he succeeds in admitting the BBC's mistakes, I think, mollifying some people in government who have definitely got the knives out for the BBC, given that the BBC has disdained and provoked them for the last 10 years over a whole range of issues, now these guys are in charge. Given the technological challenges of the, you know, Netflix and all the streaming giants which are eating the BBC's lunch, unless he rises to this challenge, and I thought... Amidst um, your deep concerns in your column, there were some really good ideas that Tim Davies should be taking on and taking seriously and not just dismissing, oh, it's just that woman in the Telegraph. As they do, uh, they dismiss me in the same way. It's ridiculous with all you know, my years of TV broadcasting experience. Unless he grabs these challenges and shows pretty quickly that the BBC gets it, I think we could be- lose the BBC in its entirety. One Telegraph reader came up with a brilliant phrase um, and they said that they thought the last night of the proms uh, controversy had been the Pearl Harbour moment. (laughs) Which I thought, well... I've, I've, Absolutely. Suddenly, Middle England was scrambled out of their torpor. They were trying to, they were trying not to be involved in this debate, but suddenly, you know, they jumped up from the officers' mess, and coffee cups and gin bottles went everywhere, and dogs were flying around all over the place, and they got into their their, their aircraft carriers. <laughs> and, <laughs> And headed for for, for yeah, W one A. Absolutely, we're all we're all on the Enola Gay now, Liam, and about to go. You know, 
<laughs> take out those smug bastards, you know. And and we, we, there was actually a YouGov survey which showed that 55% of the public was opposed to, you know, to the decision to remove the lyrics of Land of Hope and Glory and Rural Britannia. And just 5% oh. saying the songs should not be performed at all. Now, how many BBC staff are in that 5%? This is my concern. How many Conservative voters are there among BBC staff who don't clean the loos or change the light bulbs? That's really what I want to know. Now, coming back to Tim Davey, he's not your classic BBC Tristram. So maybe there's a tiny glimmer of hope. He was a Croydon scholarship boy, first in his family to go to university. He joined Procter & Gamble as a trainee. He did work in proper jobs in industry. And amazingly, he was the deputy chairman of the Hammersmith and Fulham branch of the Conservative Party. Surely not. I, I know. Surely I, some mistake. I How did he know. get through? How did he get through? So that was in that was back in the nineteen nineties, and you know he may have been he may have been suffocated by the blob since then. But he has uh, there been leaks, haven't there, saying that he's threatening to tackle the left wing bias of uh, BBC comedy shows long overdue, and is going to stop presenters like Gary Lineker tweeting out stuff when. Very political stuff, and and I think what's really upsetting about that to me, as a, a you know, as a long-standing viewer, is that the BBC is supposed to be for everybody. So when you hear when you see someone on Twitter basically ridiculing or being awful about your views, and they're a BBC main BBC presenter, you just feel incredibly alienated. I'd quite like them to get rid of immediately that mash report because that unbelievably sanctimonious man who hosts it, is he called Nish Kumar? Nish Kumar. Nish Kumar, who... Let's get him on Planet Normal and uh, <laughs> stand back. <laughs> that would be a spectator sport. <laughs> he, he's, he's, uh, he's under the Enola Gay bomb doors, I tell you. So I, I tweeted something about China, about not wanting to... Not wanting the things that were made in China after the whole virus that I thought, you know, we should be buying British. And, yeah. of course, I was sort of savagely attacked for this on the MASH report. And I was actually thinking millions of people, Liam, agree with this view and millions of those are paying your wages, mate. And that's what's happened is there has just been this kind of echo chamber that they exist in. And any joke, they think Trump is a punchline. Trump isn't, that's not funny. You know, it's a, uh, you, you know, it's just as a, a bundle of views that they attribute to Middle England. You can, what other company could possibly have such disdain for its customers? I mean, a lot of these people at the top of the BBC, they are basically, you know, they're getting paid large amounts of wedge to carry on the sort of heady days of student politics while massively virtue signalling to all their mates. They don't care if most people think they're talking nonsense. They think they're right. All their mates on Twitter retweet them. And so they they constantly confuse social media adulation with the truth or with a version of the truth that is actually uh, recognisable to the vast majority of the population. It has been a week of bad-tempered phlegm fleck debate as the schools have gone back and the BBC risks implosion uh, and we're stuck in this on-again, off-again lockdown. So I thought, Alison, we'd invite to Planet Normal a calming influence, a proper grown-up, the modest, self-effacing Stephen Pollard. Stephen's a senior journalist. He's written a column in The Express for many years and since 2008, he's edited The Jewish Chronicle. He's a staunch Brexiteer and, like us, cares deeply about the future of the BBC. Here's what he had to say. Stephen Pollard, great to have you with us here on Planet Normal. How's lockdown been for you? Uh, It's been a bit weird for me. I've been shielding. Uh, I have leukaemia. So for the first few months, uh, it feels weird to say months. Um, It's such a long time. (laughs) Uh, For the first few months, I've been basically, I was basically stuck in a room which, you know, I mean, there are there are worse rooms to be stuck in. I have a very nice view of my garden and, you know, it's relatively comfortable. But on the other hand, who wants to be stuck in a room for uh, however many months it was? And as well as that, I I thought I'd lost my job as well because the, uh, the Jewish Chronicle, which I edit, uh, went into liquidation and I was asked to step down as editor by the people who were hoping to buy it. So it was a very odd time and as it happens now i've got my job back and um 
shielding's finished i'm I'm still being careful but i, I it, it just feels like the most wonderful release to be able to go outside and i mean i went on a walk and with a couple of friends yesterday on hampstead heath and uh yeah, it's been wonderful. I also spent, don't necessarily need the full details, but I also spent three weeks in hospital as well, which wasn't so great, but uh, because you obviously no one's allowed visitors. But it, I'm in a good place now and it feels wonderful. Well, it's great that you're fighting fit, Stephen, and really good to hear that. We've known each other for a long time, haven't we? And you have omnivorous interests in politics, it seems to me. You've run the Fabian Society, you've written a an acclaimed biography of David Blunkett. You've written a book with Andrew Adonis. You now write a column for The Express. And in fact, you've been writing for The Express on and off for many years alongside your role as the editor of the Jewish Chronicle. So when I ask you the next question, I know I'm going to get a really straight answer, not an answer based on tribal affiliations or any particular loyalties. How do you think the government's doing? Um... That's a, that's a killer question, really, isn't it? Um, <laughs> look, how do I think the government's doing? I, I think the government's been dealt uh, uh, the sort of hand that no government uh, could ever imagine being dealt. Uh, I think they obviously, patently, could have done better. I mean, there's no denying that. But I do think a lot of the criticism of the government is unfair criticism and is based on the fact that people just can't stand Boris and uh, object to Brexit and so on. So I think a lot of the criticism is very party pre. That said, you know, we could go through every area of policy and find mistakes that the government's made. But I, you know, I I, I think Rishi Sunak's an amazingly impressive man. Yeah. I think his imaginative response it, you know, is genuine. I mean, look at the Eat Out to Help Out it's scheme, worked. which is only it's worked. well, his own. Yeah, and he he went he pushed it through against the advice of his civil servants, of course he you did. know, who who, <laughs> who who forced him to sign a declaration that they hadn't advised it. So you know, I think he's an amazingly impressive man. Actually, for all that, a lot of people get incredibly wound up by Matthew Hancock. I think he's done about as good a job as you could have done if you look at it purely in terms of his job, which is effectively marshalling the health service and making sure the NHS works. I mean, it's all very well to say, you know, we built all these Nightingale hospitals and so on, and what a waste of time and money because nobody used them. Well, the whole point of building them was almost to ensure they weren't used so that there was enough capacity in the NHS. I think Simon Stevens, who's not part of the government, but is, you know, the CEO of the NHS, has, has done a truly outstanding job. So I think a lot of the criticism of the government is 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 unfair. That said, as I say, we can go through almost every area of policy and, and, and find things that rightly they should be criticised over. I'll always associate you with classical music. You post an awful lot on that subject on Facebook. I know you're writing a book about the great composers. How did you feel about this latest BBC Row. Row, it seems to me that the BBC launched completely unprovoked. I think you're absolutely right. It's the most pathetic. I mean, who was piece calling? Of... Who was calling for the lyrics of Rule Britannia to be changed? Exactly. There are a few, uh, a tiny, tiny number of totally irrelevant people who are offended by the lyrics of Rule Britannia. No one takes it even remotely seriously. Uh, as it happens, the last night of the proms is something I avoid like the plague. I can't stand it. But that's not because I'm embarrassed by it. I just It's just not my type of music. Um, but I think the idea that there's anything offensive about it is so ludicrous. You only have to look at it. You know, it's, there's people waving the nationality flags of all kinds of different countries. Yeah. You know, there's the EU flag. There's every flag on, on earth, really, represented usually. It's the most, you know, and on its own terms, it's a great celebration of, of, of the brotherhood of nations, as it were, rather than any kind of, you know, Britain ruling the waves. It's a, it's a, it's a tradition, and it, it says so much about the sort of ridiculous um, sort of faux wokeness of the BBC and, and those types of uh, organisations. Your your degree was in history and your, your writing often draws on history. It strikes me that we're trying now to erase our own history. I mean, what what is it about modern Britain that makes us want to do that? I mean, I think you're right about the history aspect of it. Uh, one of the most depressing things I've found over the last 15 years years or so, is if you look at the popularity of history as an A-level um, and as a degree. You know, when I was, uh, when I was a lad, um, <laughs> uh, you know, I'm, I'm 55 now. Lick I'm, Rockley I'm of an with age. Tom. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Before when, Yorkshireman. Uh, I'm of an age where 
history was quite a standard sort of yeah. degree to take. You know, it wasn't that unusual. Whereas now, you know, history as a degree and as an A level is 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 declining. And I think that's symbolic of a of a nation that doesn't understand itself and it and is, you know, you look at it across any all, all kinds of different areas. And there is this it's difficult it's so difficult to define, but there is this embarrassment about being British, as if somehow we have something to be ashamed of because our our ancestors did things that we are indeed now ashamed of. You know, of, of course I'm ashamed of the fact that, uh, you know, we traded in slaves, but we also abolished slavery yeah. and we did all kinds of other things as well. And it's this, it's this kind of cringe at the fact of who we are that is so, so desperately disappointing to put it mildly it's also it you know I'm, I'm extrapolating here but if you look at the u.s presidential election you know i find trump repellent in every way i i i uh, you know i i, I pray almost for him. i'm not religious but i almost pray for his removal and i think biden is a a figure that i sort of warm to i think i find him quite a uh, an attractive figure in some ways but the the way in which the opponents of trump uh, behave. I mean, oh. there were there were people. Uh, forget the rioting, as if one could forget it. They were chanting "Death to America, yeah. Death to America." Well, I mean, what kind of image is that? What kind of mindset is that, where you feel so ashamed of your own nation that you are willing to uh, destroy that nation, and as it happens, hand power or perhaps to to the one man that you're campaigning against. Sorry, I've wandered off on a huge tangent there, but I do think there is a kind of similarity in the in the issues. I think Orwell puts his finger on it. He warns us about how the English, in particular, um, is that your dog, Stephen? No, don't have a dog. So sorry, <laughs> <laughs> don't know what that was. <laughs> I think Orwell put his finger on it. He he wrote that the English intellectual classes in particular seem to be ashamed of their own nation. And just going back to the, the proms and all the rest of it, you and I, we're from very different but kind of similar backgrounds in that our families have both come to the UK, you know, in recent generations. You're obviously of a Jewish background. I'm from an Irish background. And certainly instilled in my family has been a kind of gratitude to the UK that we've had this chance, uh, that it's given us opportunities. The freedoms that we have here really mean something. Uh, and I think that it seems that an awful lot of commentators, thinkers, and in fact, our national broadcaster seems to have lost sight of that, the merits of the UK. I think that's a very good point. I mean, my background is on my mother's side, Polish, and on my father's side, uh, from Belarus. And you look at those two countries now in their own very different ways. And I just thank God every day almost that yeah. I'm, I'm British. Um, and I, you know, I am proud to be British. It's, it's, it's an, it's an accident of birth. Of course, I didn't have any say in the matter, but I'm proud of the fact that I live in a country where, you know, we take decisions democratically where we do have freedoms and i you know i i saw that demonstration at trafalgar square on on saturday the the, the repellent figures like david ike and and piers corbyn protesting against regulations against coronavirus well ignore the issue itself although i think they're deeply flawed and wrong in what they're saying about the regulations but the fact that they are allowed to protest like that yeah. in trafalgar square uh, a bunch of what i would consider to be utter nutcases but the fact that that we allow them to protest uh, is, is itself a wonderfully yeah. British thing. Hello, I'm Christopher Hope, but my pals call me Chopper, and you can too. Just dropping into my second favourite podcast to tell you about another Telegraph show, mine. As a Telegraph chief political correspondent, I spend my days holding politicians to account and asking them about the things that affect you. I speak to the top politicians from across the political spectrum, commentators with their finger on the pulse, and of course, my talented colleagues at The Telegraph. So if that sounds like your cup of tea, please search Chopper's Politics, wherever you're listening to this. Cheerio! What do you make of this Twitter poll that has just emerged showing that uh, the denizens of social media 
think that Jeremy Corbyn's the best prime minister we've never had, above Dennis Healy, above John Smith, above Michael Heseltine? <laughs> well, I think we learned a long time ago that Twitter can be fun, it can be awful, but the one thing it can never be is a guide to what real people think. And I do find it utterly cringe-makingly pathetic that Jeremy Corbyn himself has actually reacted to this by posting a video <laughs> see, talking about see, how great he is and what message it is. <laughs> I mean, it's truly pathetic. <laughs> but that's the best he can come up with is that he won a Twitter poll. I mean, thank God. Thank God that is all he won, is all I can say. <laughs> But that, I mean, Labour, they are gaining on the Tories, aren't they? Starmer, he's never going to light up the sky with his effervescence, but he's reasonably competent. He's not mad. And in history, that's what Labour needs to be, just not well, mad. Well, exactly. It, it's, it's all to the good that we've got an opposition that's serious. I mean, I've, it, was, it was desperate for democracy that we only had one party that anybody could seriously vote for. I think it's, it's vital and important that we have a Labour party or an opposition party, whatever form it takes, that is... Uh, that is electable. And I think the fact that Keir Starmer, you know, I might not agree with him politically or whatever, but it's not an existential threat to the country if he wins. Um, it's just somebody else with different politics in, in power. And I think that's something we should all be very relieved about. Stephen, how representative do you think our trade journalism is these days? To what extent are people from ordinary backgrounds managing to get into the higher echelons of the media and become decision makers? I think it's always been bad, our trade, in terms of, you know, allowing people from different backgrounds in. But I think it's a lot worse now than it ever has been, basically because it's a dying industry, uh, because certainly in terms of newspapers, which is the traditional background that a lot of people have, have had before moving into broadcasting and so on. Um, and I think... You know, I mean, I noticed myself with the newspaper that I edit that, that the amount of money that we can afford to pay people, junior staff, for instance, you know, in, in some ways, it's almost impossible to live in London on the salaries that, that junior reporters and so on get without some kind of assistance from, from parents or, or grandparents or a second job or what have you. Which it means, I do that means people from London tend to get those jobs. Exactly. And I think it's... You know, it, it is a lot worse than it ever was. I mean, there is a there's another way of looking at this, which I'm not sure I necessarily buy. But that the rise of of sort of what they call citizen journalism or or you know social media and so on has opened up um, journalism to all kinds of other people who only need to be you know stuck in their room with a computer and so on. I think there's something in that, but the problem is that the journalism itself often tends to be not just sort of second rate, but barely qualifies even as the uh, of the phrase journalism. So I do think it's a, it, it's a big worry. So given all that, Stephen, given that a broad range of people aren't getting into journalism as we need them to, given that social media has sent us all crazy, what's your message to Tim Davey as he becomes the Director General of the BBC? What would you do if he appointed Stephen Pollard, which he should, as his Chief Advisor? Well, he, he's clearly got one fundamental issue above all else, which is the future of the BBC itself, the funding mechanism and so on. Um, I, I'm sort of swinging over this issue. For many, many years, I've come to the, I, I've, I've thought that the licence fee was terribly iniquitous, that it, it was outdated and, and needed to be scrapped. That's basically my view, especially with the modern media. But I, uh, and this is weird, given the problems that the BBC ha is having in terms of its output, but I, I increasingly wonder whether, you know, we do have this jewel in some ways. You know, you look at media across the across the world, really, and none of them have something that aspires to what the BBC mm. should aspire to. The problem is it doesn't the problem is it doesn't deliver that. Yeah. And I think if, if he was able to deal somehow with content and you know, recognize the country in which the BBC operates and and remove that kind of you know, stultifying left liberal metropolitan bias, then actually somebody like me who instinctively has thought that the licence fee was wrong would actually probably think, well, you know what, it may, might actually be worth it, or at least some form of public 
subsidy of the BBC if we could have that kind of elevated form of broadcaster. The problem is we don't have it at the moment. I, I agree. I think the BBC can and should be salvaged in some way with a lot less public funding, a lot more commercial funding, and certainly not the regressive TV poll tax, which the licence fee amounts to. But of course, there's now political force and motivation behind the idea of scrapping it all together. How has the BBC got itself into this mess? And how bad do you think this crisis of representation uh, and bias really is, Stephen? Um, look, I think it's it's important to separate out the the kind of um, external factor, as it were, which is that the BBC's funding model is is anachronistic, irrespective of its content. Uh, in a, in the kind of modern media world, the idea that you're sent to prison if you, you could be sent to prison if you don't pay for one particular broadcaster is is, is sort of ridiculous. Um, however. Um, you know, it's compounded, I'd say, by the, the the content problem, as it were. And it's not just a question of bias. Uh, it's also, you know, the what the BBC thinks it's for. I mean, what is Radio 1 for, for instance? What does it do that commercial radio doesn't yeah. do? What do some of the programmes that the BBC has on, on BBC One do? The ITV, I mean, there's this... There's this um, uh, singing contest, The Voice, you know, which which used to be on BBC One and switched to ITV, which I think is is the perfect demonstration of how so much of the content that the BBC delivers isn't what the BBC should be delivering. You know, the, the kind of ratings chasing it, it works against the whole notion of public service broadcasting today. It might it wouldn't have done when the BBC was the only broadcaster or was one of just two broadcasters when it perhaps was its job to try and bring the nation together every Saturday night. But that's not going to happen and never will happen now. And, and so the BBC needs to needs to actually take on board the fact that it is a, a unique to- sort of broadcaster. So it needs to provide unique content. Stephen, it's been great to have you on Planet Normal. It's been lovely to be with you. Thank you. So, Alison, some views you'll agree with, some you'll disagree with. But before we discuss what Stephen said, I just want to make clear that wasn't my dog either. <laughs> so if it wasn't Stephen's dog and it wasn't my dog, I don't think it was Theo's dog. She was doing the recording, our fabulous editor. <laughs> was this some kind of spy dog? Was this the feds clamping down on Planet Normal trying to zap us with their ray guns? <laughs> I think it's Scooby-Doo who's heard about your very, <laughs> very, very poor impersonation of him. I, I think, yes, you're right. I mean, there were things in the interview with Stephen where, of course, I did disagree, but w- what a civilised, thoughtful oh. person, exactly the kind of person top we draw. want in top draw, lovely, um, willing to, to see good in people. He doesn't necessarily agree with saying that Keir Starmer is not his cup of tea, but he doesn't pose an existential threat to our country, which is what Jeremy Corbyn did. So I love, I love that civilised thing in debate. One thing I would say, Liam, is that He thinks the government has been dealt, obviously, this terrible hand. And I agree with that. And I have supported them uh, through the early stages of lockdown. We both agreed that that no one could run the risk of, you know, hundreds of thousands of deaths. But where I re- where I don't agree with Stephen is I think it, it, latterly it's they've been much too slow to lift these measures which are paralysing our society. I mean, our children are going back to school this week. They're among the last children in the world to go back to school. We, we know how few people are back in uh, offices. Uh, most of the civil service isn't even back at work, even though the Prime Minister's time them could they please go back and you know how concerned I am about the continuing yeah. shutdown of the National Health Service yeah. Yeah. now that's going to be an existential crisis I think we're going to have 10 years of medical negligence litigation which is going to be raining down on this government which isn't treating people so so we have the two things society needs to get back to work Matt Hancock who Stephen said he thought was doing quite a good job obviously in a you know been a very very difficult position but literally this week Liam, schools are going back and Matt Hancock's giving an interview in which he's warning about the second wave. This could be terrible. People could murder their grannies. It's not the right message. And I think they're, why are they stuck? Why can't they say, I got an email this morning from a senior nurse at a regional hospital, the head of nursing, COVID is gone. I don't understand why they're shutting wards down. That's the most senior nurse at one of our major regional hospitals. COVID is 
gone. And still we're stuck. And our economy, which you know better than most, is potentially an absolute catastrophe. Why, what's going on? Why can't they move? Yeah, I think Stephen comes at this uh, a slightly different angle from, from us. He, you know, he's very honest about his leukaemia. He's been suffering for an, a number of years. And of course, in the early part of the lockdown, I was in close touch with him and he was writing and broadcasting saying how nervous he felt about people breaking the lockdown because, of course, he is very much on a, on a, in a vulnerable group. You also wrote this week, didn't you, about uh, Jai Chitnavas, the, the surgeon who, who, who did an interview with you, who's been warning that so much of the NHS is not actually firing back up to treat non-COVID patients, something we've discussed on Planet Normal many times. Uh, the wonderful district nurse you spoke to, who we called Holly, said the same thing. But Stephen, I think, is coming at this from a slightly different angle. I must say, I agree with you in the sense that there is going to be a tremendous amount of complaints, maybe even legal battles about the fact that not only the NHS itself, but also the private hospitals that have been commissioned by the NHS that are on sort of constant ongoing rolling contracts with the NHS and are still being paid, they're just not delivering this non-COVID Healthcare, even though in big parts of the country there's been no COVID now for quite a long time. This is a, a health service that we pay £134 billion a year for, Liam, and it is totally, at the moment, totally unresponsive to its customers. I've had several hundred emails from people telling the most disturbing stories down to somebody dying where nobody would come out to them. We've had a, podiat a podiatrist warning that diabetics he normally sees are going to need amputations. Um, we've had, I, I, I quoted a letter this week from Sir Simon Stephen, who's the chief executive of the NHS, and he seemed to be remarkably kind of complacent. Yeah. Um, oh, perhaps we could build in some of these changes, the beneficial changes that we've seen in the last few weeks. And you're thinking... There haven't been beneficial changes for anybody who hasn't got COVID. They've been, in many ways, an absolute disaster. And we saw the Telegraph this week warning there are people, Liam, with life-threatening conditions who are being told that they've got to wait until 2022 for a phone conversation with a specialist. Why are we paying our national insurance for people who won't even allow us to use the service we're paying for? Absolutely nuts. So on to our listener emails. Thanks to all of you who wrote in to us at planetnormal at telegraph.co.uk. Liam, what have you got? Well, Lois writes in to say, dear fellow citizens of Planet Normal, on exactly the subject we've just been discussing. Following successful cataract operations in those glorious pre-COVID days, she writes, I was referred in March for follow-up laser treatment. I chose a private hospital contracted to the NHS where there is only a six-week waiting list. No pun intended. Just in time for lockdown, I called... The hospital on the April date suggested in the referral letter if I'd heard nothing, but no answer. I waited for over 40 minutes on the NHS appointment line, to no avail. I called the office of the GP who wrote the referral. No idea what I was going on about. I've repeated this process several times with the same aggravating lack of response. My eyesight's failing. Yes, this is small beer compared to those poor souls dying unnecessarily of cancer or heart disease, but what the hell are those expensively contracted private hospitals doing? Very good question, Lois. Well, I've got a good one here from Penny Mori. Um, she doesn't agree with you, Liam. I think it's too late for the BBC, Penny says. It has a messiah complex that has been building over time. Its remit, so it thinks, is to be the moral arbiter of what the British public can know, how they should think and what they should believe. And they are the very fellows to instruct us. Added to that are its omissions, details left out of vital issues in order to sway the audience into whichever direction the BBC wants it to go. I have become sick to the back teeth of the attitudes and the programmes. Is there one I might watch without having a moral mini lecture shoehorned into the script? I've had enough and I've decided to cancel my licence. That's a fabulous email. And I know a lot of people feel the same way as Penny. Here's one from Rosetta. Great podcast. Thanks for challenging the BBC over its, over its ridiculous attitude to the prom, says Rosetta. I'm not by any means a promenader, but I do believe in the embodied power of song to express shared feelings and values. I read with bewilderment that a BBC staff members compared Royal Britannia with celebra a celebration of Nazi gas chambers. 
What on earth is going on in these people's heads? We're being bullied by ignorant hypocrites. Thank you for speaking out on Planet Normal. It's absolutely our pleasure, Rosetta. And Alison, hold on to your Planet Normal joystick. <laughs> There's breaking news. I've just got one eye on my other computer. Yeah. The BBC. They've just done a reverse ferret on the proms. Hooray! As you said in your column, you say it here, it comes out there. I, well, look, who, who, who says the media's got nothing to contribute to society? We're step by step, Halligan. Planet Normal is, you know, reclaiming civilization for the normal person. Are they seriously, are they going, are they going to let them sing uh, Land of Hope and Glory and Rule Britannia? Is that what they've said? BBC announces huge U-turn on Rule Britannia, hey. proms ban after fierce backlash. <laughs> Well, no, 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 no kidding. So it, No, no, no. Th- huge, Come on, man, huge. no fake news here. You know that. The BBC have overturned the decision to ban songs, including Royal Britannia and Land of Hope and Glory, from being sung at the last night of the proms following a huge backlash. Last month it was revealed the songs would be performed as instrumental arrangements at the Royal Albert Hall. The BBC said the decision was made in response to the restrictions in place on mass singing follow the coronavirus outbreak, as if. As if. And they've now found a new way to allow the songs to be performed. Ah. Oh. Thank God for that. I mean, you know, after after exploring all the worst possible options, they finally get there kicking and screaming, but still making the excuse that they didn't want the words to be sung because of coronavirus, which everybody knows was complete nonsense. They didn't want the words to be sung because some woke warrior at the top of the BBC thought, this is my chance to actually make a difference to the world. They absolutely, we know that's we know that's not true because Jerusalem is allowed to be sung. But of course, Jerusalem has been uh, a new version by uh, one of the approved minority groups that, uh, that the BBC wants to promote. So if Jerusalem can, Jerusalem in the new Windrush version uh, is allowed to be sung. So, but you know, it's it's uh, it, it's a good climb down, and and maybe it's a sign that Tim Davy is a bit more tuned into the. Um, to, to the revulsion that people feel with uh, having their culture and their traditions trashed by a, a minority of his uh, woke staff. Well, there we go. On that bombshell, another successful visit to Planet Normal. When exiting this rocket of sanity, this missile of common sense, remember to take all your items with you. Now, there are some certainties in the world of Planet Normal. Halligan will bring up my D in O-level maths. I wasn't going to mention it. <laughs> <laughs> Did I tell you I got a B when I took it again? Um, you keep I will... saying that. I, it's true. It was How an did easier. You get a D. Go on, carry it was, on. It was an easier exam board the second time. <laughs> I will. I bet you took the easier exam board I the didn't. first time. No, I, took, I bet you I took did. The smug one. Yeah, yeah. I will call for Gavin Williamson to resign, Private Pike. Um, and every Thursday at eleven a.m., like clockwork, we chat to fellow residents of Planet Normal. That's you, our lovely listeners, on the Telegraph website. Just go to telegraph.co.uk forward slash community. Click on the article at the top of the page and leave a comment in the comment section between 11am and 12 noon on Thursday. Liam and I will be there uh, providing some hopefully good and knockabout replies. Please come and join us. It will be really, really good fun. It is actually fun and and we both do genuinely enjoy engaging with readers and replying to their comments uh, if you don't want to join us on that community page you can always just email us with your thoughts on today's show or anything else at planet normal at telegraph.co.uk please tell others about the show your mates your mother your milkman anyone who might want to hear news and views from beyond the bubble if you're enjoying the podcast we really hope you are do leave us a five star rating and maybe a short review on apple Podcasts. A huge thanks to a listener called egregious who did just that and wrote one word under Planet Normal, home. Hope that many of you are finding a home and a haven and a refuge uh, with us. Egregious, we're very pleased to have you on board. And any questions about podcasts, how to listen, where to find the good ones, what they actually are, Alison still doesn't really know. There's a very useful article. <laughs> I have a ex- podcast. I know what it is. <laughs> <laughs> There's a very useful article explaining all things podcast on the Telegraph website, and you'll find a link to that too in the show notes of this episode. So thanks as ever to our producers, Louisa Wells and Elliot Lampitt, our editor, Theo Leludis. And as we leave planet normal and return to the madness of planet Earth, until next time, it's goodbye from me. And it's goodbye from him. <laughs> <laughs>